So yeah, yeah. I I've noticed this is kind of a trend uh, uh, that I that is is interesting for me, and maybe you could explain it. Is a lot of content creators that are like you know outside of America who have like really good takes don't necessarily speak about their own domestic politics a lot. <laughs> is that purely kind of a, a a business decision? Like, hey, I want to talk about English pol British politics or Canadian politics, but there's just not that many of us around there on the internet. So yeah. I won't make as much money or I won't get as much clout or is it, is it, you know, is it some other consideration and I'm just cynical? Well, for me personally, my background in like education is American politics. So it is something I'm like really passionate about. And um, that's something I kind of started my channel on talking about American politics. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I think as someone who's not American, it affects all of us, especially, you know, my, my own country as well. So it's something we, you know, we should talk about, but yeah, with mm -hmm. British politics, it's really, really hard to grow on YouTube talking about British politics. If I think about like British political YouTubers, I probably couldn't even name too many. The only big one I know is Novara Media. Novara, yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah. That's, that's pretty much it, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. And that makes a lot of sense to me. And, and what's interesting is I am an American and I do talk about British politics and yeah. New Zealand politics and Australian politics, and Canadian politics. So it's always funny to me. Um, because I'm trying to find good information because, you know, I don't live there on those yeah. topics, but because we're all English speakers, our politics cross pollinate, you know, for yeah. example, Chad, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Barack Obama's 2012 campaign manager, after he was done with Obama, went across the pond yeah. and he went and worked for the British conservative party Yeah, Cameron, uh, yeah. Uh, and support David Cameron's election. And thankfully... Well, you know, it ended up not working out because of what's happening. But thankfully, he's so incompetent that they really underperformed. So, uh, yeah. uh, you know, just like he fucked up our elections over here, he went over and fucked up the British Conservative Party. <laughs> so this is this is one of the things that I'm, I'm really interested in asking you about, which is yeah. as a expert, you know, as on American politics, as you would someone interested in it, what yeah. do you think we can learn from the the left in in the UK, the failure of Corbyn, and what what do you think uh, explains that? And how do you see uh, the American left responding to the crisis of you know Bernie losing and and, the, and how that affected you the UK politics? Yeah, so so I'll start with British politics because Bernie was still running for president and Corbyn lost. So I, I don't think it's like we should maybe stick in a chronological order, but basically. Yeah, yeah. I don't think the American left right now can learn too many lessons from the left, the mainstream left in, in the in the UK because of the direction we're going with Keir Starmer, who is essentially trying Joe Biden's strategy of I'm very competent and rational uh, and the other guy is crazy, but it's really not working here because Boris Johnson is very popular. Um, what but, do you, well, how but, do you account for the Boris Johnson's popularity? Well, it's it's a celebrity thing like Donald Trump. So Boris Johnson has been a well-known person for ages, but he was mayor of London. But he was pretty... London is a weird place. We had like a hardcore like Marxist, you know, Ken Livingston as mayor of London. And then we have Boris Johnson as mayor of London. Like it's the same city. It's very strange. But as the mayor of London, he had, you know, the Olympics here and stuff. He was all out there, had the messy hair, doing totally ridiculous stuff. We have this charity game every year called Soccer Aid. And he played in that and he essentially like rugby tackled someone and everyone just thinks that's hilarious and everyone calls him Boris. So he's like, he's your mate or something. And mm -hmm. it's, it, I think he's very sinister, but his kind of like clumsy, charming act does work with a lot of people. And just like with a lot of politics, name recognition is a big thing. People know Boris, they think they like him think he's just you know like a good old english guy mm. so that is something that you know is similar to trump in a way but trump was so much more polarizing because he was so much more mask off boris johnson isn't mask off he's very much mask on he will wish you know muslims happy ramadan and happy eid he'll wish right. all these community stuff he tries and this is what the conservatives have become very good at they're winning the culture war and using identity politics against the left and they'll say, because they got a very diverse cabinet, and they'll be like, well, look at us. We have, you know, the first um, Asian woman home secretary. We have various cabinet members who are from minority backgrounds. And look at the Labour Party. Most of you guys are all white. And, and although what they're doing to these communities is far worse, 
the culture war stuff and and you know if you accuse them of racism a lot of them times they just go well look at our cabinet how can we be racist so they so, they have mastered liberal identity politics it, 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 in a way i wouldn't say they're like the best at it but because when you have this propaganda machine which is the british you know printed press which is maybe something which is a bit different from american media is that the printed press is sort of king in this regard in manipulating public opinion when you have these on the Tory side, it's it's very easy to do, and it's very hard to believe in in a you know a sane reality that Jeremy Corbyn is the next coming of Hitler for Jews is what he was described as in the run up to 2019. But Boris Johnson, who talks about the cultural Marxism conspiracy theory and wrote about like really racist stereotypes of Jews in one of his books when he was younger, apparently isn't like a racist and stuff. Well, so it's. I, yeah, I actually I want to ask you about that because I I recently saw uh, 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 I think it was a focus group basically taking a deeper dive into the Corbin anti-Semitism trope. Yeah. And it really was um, people believed it. And the way they believed it was Corbin was an anti-Semite because he wants to bring in the Muslims to take over and do Sharia law. So it was a combination. Right. <laughs> it was like. He's anti, not he, oh, these people were like concerned about the anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism was proof of his attempt to, you know, great replacement theory, you know, the unconstrained immigration. He was yeah. going to support Sharia law. And so it was actually just super xenophobia. So when people said, I think Jeremy Corbett is, xeno, is anti-Semite, what they really were saying is I'm, a, I'm an Islamophobe <laughs> and one of the ways I distinguish myself against Islam is to claim that Islam believes in Sharia law and wants to kill all the Jews and et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So I don't think anyone actually, and they don't care about anti-Semitism. Like if you ask them about it, yeah. they don't give a shit. They're, they're, they're not concerned about Jewish people. It's, it's just another statement of like, it's another way of, of differentiating themselves from the people who believe that, you know, Muslims are people basically. Yeah. What do you think well, of that? Does that ring true to you or no? Well, I had I, it, partly I hadn't seen that poll, but it does make sense for me. Like I had a friend at work last year uh, in 2019 for the election. We're talking about this stuff and he's from Newcastle, which is far up in the north. And like, we're talking about the anti-Semitism stuff. And I was like, this country is really racist. Am I meant to buy that? Like most of the voter base <laughs> really care about anti-Semitism. And he's like, where I come from, it's so racist. Like you think London's bad, but like come up north and stuff. It's so much worse. So like you say, I don't believe most people even believed or cared that he was racist but like you're saying it makes more sense when because he was aligned with the palestinians and he was very very outspoken about palestine and especially in the election in the brexit referendum one of the main talking points of vote leave was we cannot stay in the eu because turkey are going to join and if turkey join right. you're not not only are you going to have like 90 million uh, muslims with being able to you know really easy access the uk you can also get terrorists from Syria and Iraq right. going through Turkey and coming here. So like you're exactly. saying, this country is so xenophobic with that stuff. So it wouldn't surprise me, like you were saying, you, you've read those those polls that they actually associate this stuff as, you know, if you're not standing with Israel against Hamas, for example, if you're standing with the Palestinians and there's some Palestinian terror groups, this guy must be like an Islamist, essentially. Right. So you, you care about the anti-Semitism because you either want him to stand with Israel or maybe you believe he actually just wants to bring like ridiculous as it sounds Sharia law into the UK. Well, and this is, this actually is where I think our conversation could be the most fruitful because you mentioned the North. And yeah. so, you know, chat it, just to give you a quick political, political geography of the UK, you know, the, the industrial North used to be the heartland of the labor party, you know, with union workers, you know, that's where the manufacturing wa was. It's very similar to America. Now I'm Mike from PA, which is Pennsylvania. And we are now part of what's called the rust belt here in the U S which is the industrial heartland. And we used to be the, you know, the base of the democratic party used to be union workers and steel plants, coal mines, automobile factories, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the industrial working class. Um, and just like in the UK here, there's this non-college educated white voter that used to traditionally be in these places, a Democrat is now shifting towards Trump. Is the same kind of phenomenon happening in the UK? And what is your thoughts on that comparison? Yeah, it, it, it's quite a good comparison. Just before I get into the English side, because the UK isn't just England, 
Mm-hmm. So Scotland, Scotland used to be big on this stuff as well, like dot workers and stuff. Margaret yeah. Thatcher, because of like austerity, privatization, things like that, completely removed a lot of jobs. But Labour, you about 15 years ago, maybe even like less than that, Labour controlled Scottish politics. Right. Now the Scottish National Party controls Scottish politics. Right. They just had their, their general election in May. Nicola Sturgeon's re-elected as, as the first minister. The SNP had a better turnout. And because of the Greens being pro-independence as well, they have a pro-independence majority there. So they want out because they feel hard done by, by this English government. And then in Wales, you have ex-coal miners, but with Wales still like you know ex-coal mining towns. I don't know if you guys have seen The Crown. It goes into a lot of that stuff on, Net- on Netflix um, in the history of the 60s and stuff. But yeah, in, in the UK specifically, in England, you have something called the Red Wall, and it's northern places and the Midlands, which are traditionally seen as the labour heartland, labour heartlands, like you're saying, like union workers, construction workers, all that different stuff. But recently, like with Trump, uh, the Tories have been breaking into the Red Wall, and it's a you know various different factors. Now, in places like the Midlands and Newcastle and other places, they traditionally have voted Labour, but not really because of like social policies. They're not like the most anti-racist people right. ever by like Poland. Not saying there's not plenty of people there, but I have spoke to pe- black people who live in Northern places who said, a lot of you don't realize what it's really like up here. Um, and it would shock you coming from such a, like a cosmopolitan city as London as I do. And I think what's happened with the Tories and, and Brexit for one, what these guys thought, a lot of them is Brexit represents a sort of, you know, um, all this stuff to do with immigration, like Polish people, all, you know, different Eastern Europeans, they come here, they take your construction jobs, they take it for lower pay, then you're out of work. And Labour Party represents this more internationalist outlook. But Boris Johnson, who the opportunist he is, used to support the EU, led the Leave campaign. And he's talking about, you know, bringing back British jobs. You know, English people will have more jobs because you won't have as right. many European immigrants freely coming here. And so a lot of people there, that sounds pretty good. These areas are so poor, but it's such a, you know, they're shooting themselves in the foot. Because, it's a false promise. Yeah, because just like Trump, Boris Johnson is saying the right things, but your problems actually come from people like him and his party, not from the European Union, just scapegoating migrants from Poland or Romania and even if less of them come here but the, the funny thing is we rely on that what you know i used to write a lot about the eu stuff before before the referendum we rely so much on european migrant workers in like every sector and they're not like the problem they're not stealing jobs and then we're going to have such a shortfall when you know everything really sets in that it's going to be such a problem but it's you know these guys are you know i don't blame them for it they're so poor their their local councils have been devastated by tory austerity even people like Tony Blair didn't help them out as much as he should as a Labour Prime Minister. So they're looking for an answer. And with Brexit, it was like, we got a chance to you know, change our future. Let's vote for this. It's going to make our lives better. And then with 2019, I call that the Brexit election, really, yes. even though we did, we did have one in 2017, because Corbyn didn't like the European Union. He's hardcore, old school socialist. The old school socialist in the UK campaigned to stay out of the European, I think it was called the common market back right. in the 70s, became the European Union. And the old school Marxists were like, we're not joining this. It will just increase uh, exploitation of the workforce. Uh, you know, this globalist economy will just profit the rich more. Um, but then Corbyn was in a hard place because most of the young people in the Labour Party want to stay in the EU. I, I myself voted to stay in the EU. But then in the 2017 election, he didn't talk about Brexit. And he didn't say anything about it. But in 2019, he was made by the Labour right, including the new leader, Keir Starmer, to take this stance, this kind of like wishy-washy stance that we're going to have a referendum, you're going to have multiple choices, you can vote to leave, uh, you can vote for a deal, or you can vote to rejoin and stuff. And then Boris Johnson was like, well, we're, the, we're going to get Brexit done straight away. We'll be in power for a month um, with this majority and we'll get Brexit done. And people love that because it was the Brexit election. These people in the North and Midlands where life has been really hard, some of the poorest areas in the UK, they're looking for change. And Brexit was that golden ticket, essentially. It didn't end with 2016. And we kind of stopped talking about it now. But I think the Tories have really used that to really surpass the Labour Party so much. And unlike Trump, they're not just all talk. They actually do some, like, they, like, they've like nationalised um, the Northern Rail. You know, what What? What Republicans are talking about, like nationalising no, different services. It wouldn't happen. But these are the guys 
where George Osborne, who was the old chancellor, and David Cameron were the austerity Tories, old school austerity Tories. Boris Johnson is this populist Tory, and the people he's got in his cabinet, a lot of them are like held in front of the public. Rishi Sunak is our chancellor. Like, here's this young, you know, a- Asian guy. Look how progressive we are. He's the future of the UK. And we're going to, you know, write. The BBC did a little picture of him as Superman when he announced his budget. You know, disgusting and stuff. <laughs> but then, uh, <laughs> but then, but then, but that, that that's wow. what's that's what's working. That's what that's what's working. And he is like one of the new favourites to be the next pri- next prime minister. And in maybe in an American context, you can't understand that. Like, what you're telling me, there's an Asian guy who's like going to be the front runner for British pr- prime minister or something from the Tory party. Like, would that happen in the, you know you know the Republican party or something? But that's what these guys are so good at. They take the language of the left a, a lot, lot of times, but then they actually do stuff while at the same time completely ripping you off all these COVID contracts, giving them to their best mates. Because cronyism in the UK, I don't know if you want to get into this later, it is very different to and corruption than political corruption in the US, where it's just so brazen in the US. But in the UK, it's very, you know, shady back rooms where they're all smoking cigars and drinking brandy. They all went to Oxford together and stuff. It's very different, but the public don't care about that stuff. Nationalise the rail, make it better. Talk about Brexit. Talk about levelling up the north. That works. Opposed to you know people like Keir Starmer, the new Labour leader, who just don't offer anything. Like, why would you vote for Labour at this point when they're not even giving you a vision of what Britain's going to look like in the next ten years, for example? Yeah. So I I think we covered a lot of stuff because it's funny you, you mentioned the Red Wall, which uh, in the America in 2016 they called that the Blue Wall. You know, and it was literally the same places, you know, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan. And it's funny because you're raising something that I think is is really interesting, which is in Scotland, which demographically is very similar to northern England. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I'm kind of curious of your opinions on the SMP, because it seems to me from an outsider's perspective, I look at the SMP and it seems to me to be like a social democratic party in the real sense but they are trading on this like Scottish nationalism. And that seems to hit exactly the same type of voters that the Tories are winning in England. The SNP is winning in Scotland. And when you yeah. vote for the SNP, you're voting for a much different program than you are when you vote for the Tories. And it seems to me that they're succeeding in gaining like, you know, they're the Scottish party. If, you, if you're from Scotland and you're kind of a, a blue collar guy, you probably are proud to be Scottish. There's a Scottish flag flying somewhere, right? But then you're also now supporting an inclusive party <laughs> that is also supporting like, you know, social democratic policies and and raising taxes on the rich or whatever. And that yeah. seems to be successful. So how do you account for for the difference between like the Scottish National Party? What are your thoughts on that party? And you know the the success that the Tories have in Northern England? Yeah, so it, you could, I'd say you, you probably understand this as well, because it's probably the Democrat and Republican visions of what, I wouldn't call it nationalism from the Scot- Scottish National Party, I'd call it like many, many like liberal patriotism, where it's like, Scotland's future is about an inclusive social democracy. It's mm-hmm. like, Scotland is multicultural, Scotland is, you know, decent and stuff. It's not what the Tories are peddling of this kind of like populism, which is talking about Winston Churchill, for example. It's not like Nicholas Sturgeon right. is roll, rolling out Robert the Bruce and William Wallace and saying, right. let's get back to Scotland like a thousand years ago. Mm-hmm. It, it's very different. And Nicholas Sturgeon, like the Scottish National Party, yeah, like you're saying, they're pretty progressive. I'd say they're to the left of the current Labour Party and a lot of stuff. Um, and Nicholas Sturgeon is, is a pretty competent politician. I actually, you know, if I have to choose a politician in the UK who I like, I'd probably say her. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty for bad Scottish... for the union, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah, it's it's bad for the union because what people don't realize is these guys weren't always so hard on the ref on on another referendum just after they lost in 2014, right. I believe. But recent but recently, because of polling, they're saying it's never been higher, and this is our issue now. We want independence. We're going to try and force independence. This is what the party stands for. So if you're like maybe this patriotic, maybe more conservative Scottish guy you're probably just like, well, I want independence. And I yes. think maybe more conservative Scots might buy into sort of tropes about maybe English oppression of Scots, which I'd maybe dispute a tiny bit as someone uh, like with an Irish background, because they like to compare, sometimes people like to compare Scottish independence with Irish unification. And I kind of like reject the the comparisons there just mm-hmm. because the, the Scots were so instrumental 
in the British Empire and also colonizing Northern Ireland. So like they like to they like to do that. But maybe these types of conservative view it like, you know, take me back to the William Wallace days or some some crap like that. I think, there, yeah. I, I, you know, just to say, I think that's absolutely part of it. I think yeah. I think the fact that they have that is a asset for the SMP. Yeah. The Labour Party Definitely. doesn't have that at all. Right. Because they're just right. associated with by those same people that maybe they're more left on economic issues. You know, they want union rights. They want, you know, they want wages to be higher, you know, but they still have this kind of, uh, you know, patriotism, as you said. And I think this is this is an exact problem that we have in these like the, the, the left right now is in America, too. There is seems to be a type of left that's growing among the youth, the more cosmopolitan left, the socialist left. Yeah. And I don't necessarily see as much of its success in those like blue collar, lesser educated people that used yeah. to be the base of the Labour Party and the Democratic Party. And quite frankly, it's a large demographic, like that's a large number of people. And the left cannot win without a large percentage of those people. It's just the math. Yeah. If you're relying on college educated people, there's not enough of them to win a majority. You just, that's, that's a dead end. You need to have uh, a, a large number of people that are, you know, working class that support the left. This seems to be obvious, but it doesn't seem to me that there is a, a, a reckoning with that among like the Labour Party, whereas the SMP has had that success. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, 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 I agree with that to some extent and don't, because I think you can have a more internationalist, cosmopolitan outlook and still win these voters, but then you've just got to offer them something right. that I agree will drastically, you. yeah, drastically improve. So Jeremy Corbyn in 2017, he was meant to get trounced. He did very well, massive embarrassment for the Tory party. And it, I think it was Labour's best election since either 2000, I think maybe 2007. And they got more votes than most elections they'd had since 1997, which is when they had the big blowout with Blair. Um, but the, the thing massive was, overperformance, just just to, just to step in. Sorry to explain yeah. the chat. So this is this is something that happened is when Corbyn took over the Labour Party and he did so through a grassroots election from the yeah. rank and file members. Right. Uh, he was yeah. opposed by the Parliamentary Labour Party, which is all the establishment politicians that were in Parliament as as Labour leaders, right? They yeah. were against him, but the rank and file people, the people that pay to be members of the Labour Party, voted him in as leader. Yeah. And from that moment, we've covered this on my stream, there was a move within the Parliamentary Labour Party to sabotage him, to try to get him to be defeated, basically. Yeah. Uh, that he, The idea was that he was too far left and it was going to be a disaster. Uh, and going into the 2017 general election, which was a snap election called by Theresa May, yeah. um, there was all this polling that the Tories were going to gain massive amounts of seats. It was going to be a blowout. Jeremy Corbyn was going to be humiliated. He was going to underperform. He's, you know, blah, 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 blah. And what ended up happening is, first of all, the polls were all garbage because they were manually adjusted to give the, the, the Tories a boost. And this is something I actually called live on stream. I said, looking at this data, in America, they wouldn't do this. They're, think, they're, they're fiddling with the polls in a way that we don't do it in America. This is total yeah. bullshit. Corbin's going to outperform. And then he did, massively outperforming. And he was only a few thousand votes short of becoming prime minister. Isn't that right? Yeah, the way it works is a bit weird in the UK because of like the seats. But yeah, he he the thing what he did is that this is when we were negotiating Brexit, and it was such a massive like you know shock is that the, the Tories because they were divided on what how to deal with Brexit. Like you had the Theresa May faction versus the Boris faction. She actually needed the DUP, who are the biggest Scottish not Scottish biggest Northern Irish Unionist party, and she paid them like a lot of money to back them up on everything to do with Brexit. And then it just put the whole parliament into gridlock. That's why we didn't leave the European Union until recently because of this election, thankfully. And it's this is a guy who doesn't even like the European Union, but he, he outperformed, I think, and shut a lot of Labour you know, centrists up is because of his message. Because what you saw in the UK is in places like London, you've got a lot of young people turning out and maybe people from communities that might feel a bit, you know, dissatisfied with the voting process. Like the big thing with me is it was really funny to see lots of um, prominent black rappers from places like London all come out and endorse Jeremy Corbyn, people who don't traditionally talk about like parliamentary right. politics. 
but he obviously had something. There's a chant, oh, Jeremy Corbyn, which young people always like start up, you know, at festivals and stuff, because yeah. he, he has this message of the future does not have to be like really, really bleak. It, you know, and it, he's an old school socialist as well, but he has this more progressive social message. So he appeals to both people and it shows that this type of politics ca can work. And it's not like Tony Blair was warning about a year ago, don't get involved with like the, tra the transgender culture war. But the thing is, um, Jesus Christ. You, you, yeah, you, yeah, awful guy. But you can you can do you can like walk and chew gum. It, you know, some people I read a good article from 2008. It was like the racists who voted for Barack Obama. And it was a really interesting article about how people who are like insanely bigoted to, to African-Americans voted for Obama because he promised them like a better economic like, right. deal than John McCain. So you can you can get people who like necessarily don't agree with your stance on the Palestinians in Israel or don't agree on your stance on transgender rights and stuff. If, you know, it, it sounds bad because it feels like you're bribing them, but it's like, I will make your life better. And when when you say to someone like John McDonald, who was the old shadow chancellor, he said, you know, if we get in, we're going to try UBI out. We're going to nationalize this stuff. We're going to try create a state pharmaceutical uh, generic drug company. So we won't let people like rip us off and stuff. These are all popular policies, good policies. The only thing that happened in 2019, as opposed to 2017, was the Boris coup in the Tory party and basically being a rerun oh, of Brexit. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I did something with the with the with, this, oh, okay. with the camera. Go on. Um, no, it's not a problem. And then, um, but I think the success of Bernie to an extent and the success of Cor success of Corbyn. And I, and I think Corbyn's way more openly radical than Bernie Sanders. If you watch Bernie Sanders in the right. 1980s interviews, you can see, yeah, they probably are pretty similar. But the, you know, the what Bernie Sanders is today is mainly like, yeah, the US is so far to the right anyway. I'm just going to advocate for like sane policies, and they'll still see me as a crazy socialist. But like Corbyn was like, no, we're going to like create this whole new like socialist society where where everyone will be equal. And I, it's just very depressing. Like 2017, I felt so hopeful. And I didn't even vote in the local elections because I was so crushed by 2019. Like all hope. It was like the Tories won such a massive majority. And then um, and the polling for them has been consistently good during the pandemic, even though they've handled it so badly. And, and I think they've really you know pulled the rug under, pulled the route the rug out from under the Labour Party and taken what Corbyn and McDonald did so well. And what's funny, McDonald often tweets about the Tories' new policies, and he was like, this sounds familiar and he put like the eye emoji because they basically are his policies they've ripped off so it, it's a lesson that the Labour party didn't learn and the tories did learn and that's why i'm really scared for this country in the sense that i think we're going to have the tories for probably like another 10 years it's gonna be like the you know the, the thatcher thatcher major era all over again but I, um I, yeah but, but overall yeah like I, I think there are some comparisons to be made with bernie and corbyn maybe just uh, bernie's a bit more to the right in public i guess so what one of the things that i've always one of the challenges that i've always had for people like jeremy corbyn and bernie sanders is i think they lack a killer instinct um yeah. i i think this is the big problem with the left yeah, is definitely. like uh bernie sanders and jeremy corbyn existed in a time when you know for the most part they were kind of marginalized backbenchers and whenever they got something done, it was through like glad handing with, you know, people that were to the right of them and kind of having a good personal relationship. And they never really learned how to be in charge. And so when their message became so popular and they got thrust in that position, they never learned like, OK, now I need to consolidate power. I need to get rid of the people that are my enemies. <laughs> I need to get rid of the people that are trying to yep. sabotage me from within and put my people who believe in my program forward. I won with this program. If you don't support my program, you're out. Uh, yep. And whereas the centrists have are well accustomed to the reins of power. And so they have used every method and tactic possible to retain it. And we've been kind of caught flat footed. And so... Do you see, you know, and, and quite frankly, I just don't see that changing in America. Like, I love, you know, AOC and Bernie and, and, and you know, some of the people that are in Congress now. But I see the same mentality. I don't see kind of a ruthless, like, hey, we need to throw these people out. Uh, we need to throw Pete Buttigieg's under the bus. That's not really the, the energy yeah. I see. And that's what concerns me in the long run. Because you just said you saw that the UK is headed towards a long 
time of of Tory control. And I have to say, I see America going towards a long time of Republican control. Uh, I think right now, and, and if you want to disagree with me from another perspective, it'll be interesting. I see this as the high water mark of the Democratic Party for probably the next 20 years. Um, and, you know, we were talking about today is the Republicans are drawing up plans for gerrymandering, the likes of which have never been seen, uh, and voter suppression, and the Democrats can't pass a voting rights law um, to protect the right to vote. So yeah. what do you think about that, uh, the future of like minority rule in both the UK and the United States? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the UK because you make a great point. What Jeremy Corbyn should have done when he was in charge of the Labour Party is get rid of everyone who was trying to undermine him. And like you're saying, these guys, I think Bernie and Corbyn especially, they Too nice. are such they're so genuine like their policies come out of them being such genuinely nice people like jeremy corbyn just like some harmless old dude with like an allotment and stuff he's very like very very i guess wearing a sweater innocent. his mother made <laughs> yeah he's 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 very very like genuine um but bernie is the same but what you kind of need and i hope younger angrier people take power where they're like if you're not you know, in a, in, in a British context, it's like a, a bit different. But in America, it's like there's so much broken that's so apparent to like the whole world, like universal health care. Like how, how does Cuba have universal health care when it's under embargo? But, but the, the richest country in the history of the world cannot have it. And like that is such a key issue that you can rally around. But it's like Pete Buttigieg saying Medicare for all who want it. Joe Biden, the current president, saying something a bit similar that we're just going to lower the age for for Medicaid, I think, and stuff like that. So it's like what they should be doing is calling these people out because they're not really allies. And I can understand for a bit like maybe playing nice in the first couple of days of Joe Biden's like reign. And, and it was good to see the you know the squad talking about Israel at Palestine in such right. like a, a candid way. Like I've never seen that in politics. Like. British or First American, time. I ne- yeah, I have <laughs> never seen never seen people talk about the conflict uh, or the conflict, the you know the apartheid regime of Israel like that. So I feel like it. I feel like there is more hope in America. And the only thing I would say is because Joe hmm. Biden and the centrists tolerate the squad more than the centre of the Labour Party tolerate the socialists in the Labour Party. Because I think what Joe, you know, remember how much they liked Bernie after he lost. Oh, mm-hmm. Bernie, you're so great. Like, come help us with the election. Yeah, like, statesman, yeah. Bernie. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 need, we need you, Bernie. Even though we'll demonize you, we'll get people on TV saying you're like hypnotizing people. Or uh, Central like Park, that. they're going to, if, if Bernie Sanders had won, we would have taken yeah. the century, we would have had executions in Central Park. It was something that it's, would. It, exactly. It's, and then, and then but, but that's the thing. That's, that's the thing, the difference with the Democratic Party is that they'll say that. And then they'll go back on it. So, but, but like you're saying, they got the killer instinct. They'll win and go back on it. Where with the Labour Party, it's a non-stop purge. So Keir Starmer wins the leadership election. Uh, he he get he beats Rebecca Long Bailey, who's a socialist MP, sticks her as shadow education secretary. She then set, shares an article where a celebrity said that um, the IDF uh, teach American police tactics, and then said that they teach them how to kneel on necks, like. You know what happened with George Floyd. Maybe that wasn't strictly true, but the overall point was Israel trained the American police. It's then called Keir rhetoric. Star- <laughs> yeah, but then, but then Keir Starmer fired her for anti-Semitism because of that, and, and he he used what? And this is, yeah, no, but it's it, it's so it's so cynical for a guy who's apparently come into the Labour Party to restore faith um, in the Jewish community in the UK, using um, criticism of Israel, even though the, the most. The, the only justification I could see that someone said is it's saying that Jews are responsible for everything bad in the world, including George Floyd. And I just don't really understand. That's that not what she said. She no, said no, that the IDF trained American police in violent tactics. And that yeah, led think, to things like but, kneeling on George Floyd's neck. Yeah, but that's actually yeah. just a factual statement. But but that was what he used his stuff for. And then he obviously kicked Jeremy Corbyn out of the Labour Party because after an in- investigation into anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, said Jeremy Corbyn was an anti-Semite, said there was anti-Semitism. And he came out and said, yeah, there is anti-Semitism in the party. That you know, It's a massive problem in the country. Um, and basically saying we need to do better. And then Keir Starmer said, that's not good enough. You're out of the Labour Party. So, so that, that's... Just not to interrupt you, but we actually yeah. talked about that training. I think it was either yesterday or the day before the IDF American overlap yeah. because, uh, you know, the, the militarization of the police department in Israel in the West Bank, like the police officers are the ones that are being used to evict 
Palestinians from their homes illegally yeah. against international law for the, in, in, in cooperation with these far right settler groups. And so we and then we went and, t and I showed, uh, uh, you know, countless examples of police departments in America going to Israel for training. And then those train and then and then the violence that is enacted on Palestinians in the West Bank is the same violence that we see against Black Lives Matter protesters, etc. Yeah. So this wasn't an anti-Semitic screed. This is a no. statement of fact. Yeah. And here in America, we know it to be on the American left and the American center left. We know that that's true. So yeah. she got fired for a fact. But the, but the thing is, she didn't even say it. She shared an article, and the content of the article wasn't even about that. It was just a statement at the end of it. So she got fired for sharing that. It's not even like she said uh, the IDF train American police, and there's a connection between um, the tactics used by IDF and various affiliated police forces and the American police on various oppressed groups in, in both countries. She didn't even say that. Not that that would be wrong, but she didn't say that. So this is what these guys do, and, you know, would you say it's more problematic to conflate that with anti-Semitism itself? Of course. Um, yeah. Of course. <laughs> exactly. And, and it, one of the things I want to I wanna talk about this is it, I think Americans, especially the left, we're more accustomed to the very extreme right Zionist yeah. playbook. And so the, the squad are people that emerge through the fire of that. There are people that have been under siege and and for a certain extent people on the left now in america are accustomed to going like oh this is zionist bad faith garbage and they can be re rejected a little bit more easily uh, yeah. and we have a jewish left here like jewish voices for peace even j street you know organizations that try to critique israel with jewish voices from the left where they haven't been as discredited as it seems in in the uk you have it's like almost new like the zionist approach to politics is like emerging uh yeah. and and the bad faith attacks of like anti-semitism um also i think with bernie sanders being the leader that was it luck because bernie sanders is jewish yeah. so the attacks of anti-semitism are not effective when the leader of the american left is jewish so that kind of like scrambled the typical tactics is, you know, this is guy's uncles were killed in the Holocaust. You're calling him an anti-Semite. That's pretty ridiculous. And so it doesn't work. Yeah. Well, they tried, they tried though. They tried, <laughs> tried they tried, tried but it didn't, it didn't play because, you know, yeah. it, you know, he's, it is what it is. And they still, tr but the fact that they still tried says something. Um, yeah. So you're optimistic about America. And I got to say, like, you know, the problem that we have, the reason why I'm not optimistic is we don't have a parliamentary system. Yeah, we have a fundamentally corrupted system with an electoral college and a Senate and ge political gerrymandering, which I don't think that, you know, you guys have anywhere near. I mean, it's probably going to be brought there. I can tell you, like American consultants are probably going to come over to the UK and, and teach you guys how to do gerrymandering uh, yeah. for redistricting. Um, but like it won't matter if the Democrats win 60 percent of the vote. No, yes. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I'm, I, well, I'm, I'm more hopeful about the Democratic Party. I'm not more hopeful about the them getting about, power. <laughs> yeah, about them getting power because um, it's just like pivot to American politics. I think Joe Biden, like people, it, it's crazy to me because I made videos about this maybe like two years ago about his history of like racism, basically standing so badly on every issue, but the stuff he did on the war on drugs still affects Americans today. I think in, and if it was Pennsylvania, but they tried to set up um, a clinic where addicts could go use um, like clean needles, clean drugs to get off right. them. But because Joe Biden had ensured this like crack house law in one of these drug laws back in the the eighties, um, the government, the local government, used this to shut it down. So this is like a crack house basically mm -hmm. because of the the wording in Joe Biden's law. And then obviously working with segregationists and, and awful stuff. So what Obama you know, is the worst for, in my opinion, is making this guy like something he, he's not. Like people like Joe Biden because he's biased, you know, associated with Obama and people like Obama. It's not that like Joe Biden's policies are anything great. So like you're saying, I'm, I'm not optimistic in the sense, even the gerrymandering stuff, Joe Biden isn't going to give you this radical agenda. I know the the centrists that all like patting themselves in the back and like, oh, he's better than everyone thought, more progressive. He passed what one law. God. This is propaganda. Yeah. <laughs> he's passed what wonderful one law and it's been over yeah. two months. But but then like obviously his response to um, what's going on in uh, Palestine is 
probably showed you he's not too different from a lot of the people who came before him and stuff. So I, I'm not optimistic about that because I feel like when you're trying to go in a more centrist direction, you can't really out centrist or out right wing the right because they're exactly. more genuine in their convictions and you're just going to alienate people on your side. So it's, it's you know, in, in our own election with Keir Starmer, like I said, he was trying to do the Joe Biden strategy. Um, I'm not going to be too radical. You say you'll give nurses 1% raise, I'll give them 2%. Like, what's the difference there, really? So, like, it's just this guy who, um, in our country, and I feel like this is why we're screwed, when you have a guy who stands for something, no matter what it is, and he's so, like, I stand for this, this, and this, and you're versus someone who barely stands for anything. Joe Biden got very lucky. Like, the turnout was insane because it was such a polarizing election. You you know, I think you're probably worried about this as well. You can get a smarter Trump. Some Trump who's more like Boris Johnson, who's not outwardly, like, totally insane, who won't, like, just spout off random racist stuff on Twitter at night. He'll be, like, very competent, and he'll use the infrastructure of the Republican Party to seize power. And the next election, he could ride Trumpism, maybe, maybe a more, like curtailed uh sanitized version of trumpism to take power and then you might have what we have in the uk where you have ineffective left stands for nothing and a guy who people like and people think stands for a lot of things so that that's where if i was you i, I would be afraid for the american uh, democratic party I, I mean like i i you know i gotta be honest with you i think people are not pessimistic enough <laughs> uh, as somebody, you know, uh, I ran in 2014 for a state legislative office and uh, right after new gerrymandered maps here in Pennsylvania. And it's, it doesn't matter. Like, uh, we now have data on people where we can predict your vote with very high certainty. Uh, yeah. And if you just draw the maps and we have this pinpoint precision, we know exactly where you live and we have a model on you. That's the way the Democratic Party and Republican Party works now. They can just rig it. I, I mean, they could just make the elections at the same as an election in any other authoritarian system where it's just you show up and there's a candidate and it doesn't matter uh, that the selections have been made for you and there's really no com competition. Um, and Joe Biden's win was by the skin of his teeth. He won w you know, with a wide popular vote majority, but he barely won in Pennsylvania. He barely won in Wisconsin. He barely won in these very pivotal states. Uh, and if you add the voter suppression, if you add the um, gerrymandering, if you add, you know, the rules that are changing around, you know, uh, provisional ballots, he would have lost uh, and even winning by millions of votes. Uh, and I think that's what we're accelerating towards and a Republican Party that, quite frankly, is now openly saying stuff like they think the Democratic Party is illegitimate. Uh, and that's kind of the 70 percent of Republicans think the election was stolen, which is just a yeah. batshit and crazy, insane position. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, Noam Chomsky recently said that the you know Republican Party is the most dangerous organization that has ever existed in human history. And I agree with him. Uh, and I think they're very close to like achieving a system that is almost semi-permanent in their favor. Uh, yeah. uh, like at the state legislative level, they're like two states away from being able to write constitutional amendments. Uh, so, you know, I, I, you know, maybe that maybe the squad and AOC and stuff, and there's, there's things to be hopeful about, but from a, from a 20,000 foot view, I couldn't be more pessimistic. Uh, I, I, I just... You know, and, and as somebody who is a leftist who believes that we should engage in, in electoral work, you know, it's that 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 possibility seems to be getting foreclosed more and more to me. And and something like the balkanization of America or, you know, and the UK, too, with this with the with the SMP. I think those are the, the, the political trends that might start to emerge more over the next couple of decades. And. So what do you think about that? Just to just to maybe uh, bring it back to to the SMP. Do you think that the the union will break up, or is this gonna get blocked via you know Westminster's you know refusal to recognize it and the EU being worried about you know the problem redounding to yeah. other member states? Well, well, it's interesting because of what you were just saying. The the big thing about Scotland as well is um, it used to be such a Labour stronghold. And now the SNP have taken over, it's just those Labour votes are gone. Like, 
the Tories like not not it's dividing them up a bit more. But the thing is, like, yeah, with the with the SNP, the thing that what something about the British I don't really understand in the English is a very um, you see those riots in France like all the time, like union workers, protesters. Right. Br- British people aren't like that. Um, so I, I'm trying to picture a scenario where Scotland have a referendum, maybe maybe you know. Westminster wouldn't mandate it, but they have a referendum that's overwhelming for Scottish independence. I don't know what happens next then. Is there like genuine agitation? Because is it so bad in Scotland that, you know, or is the sentiment so much in Scotland they would start violence, like violent protests against, um, you know, police that are from the United Kingdom and stuff? So I, I just don't know, but I, I can see, and this is what I think in general, I can see the trend of the UK splitting up actually happening to countries i don't think that will split are england and wales scotland for sure i want to and it wants to itself and i'd support that northern ireland is also heading the way of irish unification because right. the republicans talk about are that. yeah so so uh Sinn fein who are the republican party in both the south and the north are the second biggest party in northern ireland they're i think they're like the fourth or fifth biggest party in in the republic of ireland um, just because sometimes people get confused, there are two islands, and I, I know I've spoken to some Americans sometimes who think uh, actual Ireland is part of the UK. <laughs> Republic of Ireland is, is the, the country that became independent through like the original IRA and the struggle right. there, but the part of the agreement was the British get to keep you know, the top part of Ireland, Northern Ireland. Gerrymandered an area that they got to keep. <laughs> Also funny, it's the most uh, like wealthy part of Ireland, which uh, is where the Sc- Scots and the uh, English settlers started with and stuff. But um, now they're like after everything has happened, and and the Good Friday Agreement states that like we recognise the will of the Irish people to become one, basically one country. That's why there's been so much trouble lately. I don't know if you've seen it because of the stuff with Brexit, because there's new um, regulations on trade uh, between Northern Ireland and the European Union, and that was a big thing between the countries as well. So there's a lot of unhappiness in Northern Ireland. The Unionist people are unhappy at their leadership for basically they think sending them out to Boris Johnson over Brexit because Northern Ireland did vote vote to stay in the EU. I think it's about sixty percent to forty something. Um, so I'm hoping that. You know, as an Irish person, uh, Irish background, I want Irish to be unified. I, I think it would be the best for Ireland to rejoin the European Union as well. And just because the English government right now, um, I don't know any country that is semi like sovereign. You know, these guys have their own parliaments. Why would you want to be ruled by these guys? Like they're so incompetent. They're so outwardly corrupt. And I think that's the big thing. The Trumpist effect on the UK is these guys are outwardly corrupt. They don't right. care. They're, they're brazen now. It, it, like I said, it used to be you know, handshake here, like, you know, this guy from Oxford, give him a contract. Now it's like that health secretary was found to have broken the law and nothing happened. Given dodgy contracts to his mates for like personal, um, the protection stuff for for COVID um, to companies that didn't even make this stuff, but they were his personal friend from school. And and that's the thing. So I hope that these guys see what this is. And it's like, we want to be run by at least competent people. And Northern Ireland, the the, Repu- the Republican side is more liberal, but the Unionist side is very conservative. It's one of the most conservative sides in the whole of UK politics. Anti anti abortion, anti gay marriage. It's very stark difference to the rest of the UK. So right. there's going to be problem. There's going to be problems there. But I think what you're going to see is the breakup of the UK. And to end on, on the point, I don't uh, know if you saw this on Twitter. The Northern Independence Party. Yes, I, don't I know did. If you've seen this. Okay, <laughs> I so, did. <laughs> So I don't know how much feeling there is for that. If some of your audience watch the show Vikings, you'll know that Northumbria used to be a country in England or a kingdom in England. So they're saying, we're going to take it back to the borders from like uh, 450 (laughs) AD Mm -hmm. uh, to historic Northumbria and we will rule ourselves. But but it's an interesting point. I think in America <laughs> you have you you have a you have a bigger chance for it because the California stuff I think is really interesting because it's like here is is a, an economy which even by global standards is is very you know doing very well a population which is about the size not it's forty million or something so the British English population is like fifty five so it can be its own country very very easily it's just you know and if if you're saying you know let, let's play out your scenario of the Republicans let's say they're in power, for, you know, basically it seems like forever, will there be more agitation from like people like Californians or other people on, on you know, maybe New York, it could be hard to see, but like, do you know what I mean? Like I can see it a bit more 
where especially with you know what i was happy with in america i know this sounds kind of weird but it's like the black lives matter protest i, I was happy that i could see parallels with hong kong like these people like working together to counteract the police and stuff that's not going to happen in britain maybe it's the escalation of militarization but i feel like there's genuine hunger in america maybe for a bit more of a struggle for like your rights whereas england it's kind of like we're doormats and be like oh yeah that's fucked up but what are you going to do basically so i, I, I think, don't know, I don't I know think what you think about there's, that. there's two there's two parts of this first i would say there there it probably is more of a, a desire for a struggle but there's yeah. also a culture of like police support and military support and like just a general culture of fascism that's much more yeah. developed than the yeah, uk I guess that's true. uh and, and like you know one of the problems is like you know we have video of people being murdered by police or yeah. relatively minor offenses or you know a modicum of resistance or, or you know they had a knife but they were walking away they get shot in the back and that yeah. kind of stuff is just even though it's on camera People are just like, well, and they develop these uh, these techniques of defending it. We have in Florida, for example, they just passed a bunch of new riot laws um, that will like legalize, you know, make it much easier for people to run over protesters and get away with yeah, it. Crazy. Um, you know, stuff like if you're involved in a protest and somebody commits property damage, then you could be charged with a felony for, you know, being in a riot. And so, and then also, you know, targeting the organizers. So say I organize yeah. a protest, right? And we go and we protest peacefully. And I say it's a vigil. And then an hour later, somebody comes and breaks the Starbucks window. I'm the riot organizer now. <laughs> Yeah. And that's the type of, of stuff that's being developed. There's, you know, in, in state after state, there's new laws being passed that are that are targeting protesters and um, or, you know, criminal charges. We have a police that is extremely militarized. Um, and so, you know, I I don't know how far down the doomer path I'm I'm going to walk. I'm just <laughs> saying that in front of me right now, I see a worrying lack of like willingness to struggle for even basic democratic principles yeah. and a right wing in the uk and especially in america that is willing to abandon them for power well, well uh, I, when i saw that stuff in florida it came just after we passed an anti-protest bill where you could get 10 years in jail for like throwing a tomato at a statue of winston churchill i'm not even joking <laughs> like th th this was this if, if a judge was zealous enough he could send you to prison for a decade for that. And uh, there were massive protests, like violent protests. What One of my friends uh, went to a peaceful protest but was beaten up by police. And then we actually had also like a policeman murdered a woman. There was a vigil in um, London for it. And then the police came and started beating up all these women. Um, so like- Yes, I, I, we, I, we covered I, that actually, yeah. Oh, okay. So it's like, um, America, like you're you're right. Like the the stuff American police get away with, and even like the George Floyd stuff, it's such a cultural war issue. You know Ben Shapiro is going to go on his show and say how this guy was basically innocent, despite you know the footage just being in front of you. This guy is a hundred percent guilty. Steven Crowder did a pantomime where he pretended yeah. like he had him kneeling on his neck, but he couldn't <laughs> actually have him kneel on his neck for more than five minutes. But the point is, their delusion is so strong. Yeah, that they're willing to put themselves in that situation to be embarrassed because they're so up their own asses like they can't yeah. even tell that whoa this might be a bad idea and that shows you how delusional and unhinged they are and they quite frankly have a lot of support but it's 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 very scary because what, what i always get frustrated about you know so-called educated people like ben shapiro is they're paid a lot of money to save this stuff uh, and presumably they won't really feel the consequences because they're leading um, your country uh, and into like fascism essentially like they're making people not believe reality just for their paycheck and, and i think that someone like dave rubin is like a perfect example of someone who you know poses like a liberal he's paid a lot of money and basically has all this stuff and and you can say you know they're so shameless in america this the the window shifts so much on what is reality like this isn't like gerald ford's republican party anymore it's right. it's right ronald reagan let in the crazies essentially let in the white evangelicals who want iran and israel to have a war to start armageddon and it's just like this this party and this group of people who no longer live in any semblance of reality 
because uh, at least with the UK, I can understand why people buy what Boris Johnson is selling. But with with with, with the lack of basic things in America, like universal health care and various other like social safety nets, and then you have a guy like Trump who is so corrupt and, and doesn't hide it, who's so like out of touch with reality. And, and people just love that. It's like it, it, in my head, I'm like, is, is it, there's just two, there's just like two Americas now. There's one side um, and it's, you know, various different factions, as, as you know, like liberals, leftists and stuff who believe in like some semblance of reality. And then there's a side that just won't believe anything is true. Again, like that's that stat you said about 70% of people believing Joe Biden didn't win the election. How do you how do you reverse that? Like, can you reverse it? I, I mean, like, you know, I, I think it's not a surprise. It's not, a you know, an accident that these people exist. They're intentionally manufactured by the Republican Party and their yeah. media allies. Uh, there's something that I've talked about before. I urge people to look at called the Powell Memo, which was written by a former Supreme Court justice who talked about their in the 70s with Roger Ailes, who and it went on to found Fox News, for their intentional decision to try to create propaganda networks, think tanks, and take control over the media, academia, and the government. Like this is this is a conspiracy that is like was out in the open and it continues to be yeah. to manufacture alternate reality. Uh and so these people that believe this shit they believe it because they that's the information they're getting constantly. And yeah. alternate sources are discredited. Like if you go to one of these Republicans and you say, hey, there's no evidence that the election was stolen. They'll say to you, you're crazy. I saw it on TV. <laughs> yeah. The president says it was stolen. All my leaders are saying it was stolen. And you're bringing the deep state CNN globalists <laughs> who are all corrupted and you want me to believe yeah. them over my president, over my, my leaders, over the, you know, the media that I watch, they, they, there's no way of, uh, there's no intercourse between yeah. the two sides. There's no exchange of information. There's no trust. And that was intentionally manufactured. And this is why I'm so like damn pessimistic because, you know, January 6th happened and the Republicans don't care. Yeah. Uh, and, they don't give a shit that many of them were almost killed. Uh, and they've, they've, they've it, you know, it reminds me so much. I, I know it's belabored to talk about Germany because, you know, it's, it's so ridiculous. But it, it is very similar to the beer hall putched of just Hitler tried to overthrow the government and got a slap on the wrist. And that is the situation with Trump. He tried to overthrow the government. He wanted the government overthrown. He failed, but he got a slap on the wrist. And he's no. going to be back in 2024 and the Republicans are laying the groundwork that if this election's even close, they're going to be able to steal it. And when I say close, I mean, 2020 close. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely like, um, the one thing, cause I make a lot of like anti-fascist content. Uh, I was talking about, um, golden dawn in Greece and basically how they fell away is cause they got prosecuted for being the criminals they were. Right. And, and, all their leadership are essentially either fled the country or they're in prison because they constantly broke the broke the law and like they actually like, got prosecuted for it though yeah, and that's and, the and, problem yeah, and prison yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but that's but that that yeah that is is the problem like you're saying i don't think obviously you can't always compare stuff to you know different contexts with you know germany obviously isn't the best example mainly because the economic situation then and, and different things like that and like the history of things like anti-semitism but but you're right in the sense that like if you don't, if there's no consequences for trying something so extreme, like most of those people involved in that stuff um, weren't prosecuted properly. And even the people who were didn't really face too many consequences. So you're basically telling people, yeah, if you're a Republican, go into like the speaker's office and mess around with a computer and maybe you'll go to prison for like one or two years and some of you will get let off. So it's not really a big consequence. And your president will be on the lawn in a tent watching it all on TV thinking it's wonderful. So yeah, it's just yeah. like, the, no, like the thing, yeah, like you're saying, like you have to have consequences breaking the law. But America, like most countries, I think America's the worst. It's obviously rich people, even like, you know, I, I listened to loads of stuff about Jeffrey Epstein and how he got off in the first place. 
rich people do not play by the same rules. And, and Jeffrey Trump, Epstein's Trump, Jeffrey, the guy who yeah. gave Jeffrey Epstein a sweetheart deal, went on to become Trump's yeah. <laughs> Secretary of Labor. Yeah, you know, exactly. uh, and, and and to to talk about that is exactly the problem that we're facing, which is just we don't have the means. And in Golden Dawn, I'm glad you brought that up, Chad. If you look this up. The, the precincts where the Golden Dawn did the best in Greece were the precincts where the police barracks were, where the police lived. Yeah. The neighborhoods that police lived in, Golden Dawn got 70% of the vote. All right? So these fascist movements, you know, and in America, uh, uh, there's an old uh, police magazine uh, poll of their, of their readers. Donald Trump got 80% of the police vote in America. Hillary Clinton, I think, got like seven. Damn. <laughs> so that is the that's the situation that we're in is like we have a highly politicized military today i just discussed how the secret service on a lot of secret service agents on their social media were speaking in favor of the rioters at the time they were kind of defending them you know attacking uh you know the elections integrity and stuff and at a very as you know praetorian guard-esque environment uh, one of the Secret Service's most senior officials actually left the Secret Service and worked for Trump during uh, the administration uh, surrounding immigration. And then after the Trump administration looked to be ending, he went back to the Secret Service and he's now the head of training. So we have these situations that are like, uh, you know, the, the warning signs should be flashing, you know, about the health of American democracy, where we're headed and frankly, like the weak opposition of the left, um, yeah. you know, I know everybody's always trying to say that we're in a, you know, a Weimar moment and, you know, everybody, you know, but I can't help but look at the political situation of the world. Look at India with Modi, you know, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, and see the rise of the far right, you know, Brazil. And I don't see the counterbalance. I yeah. don't see a strong left like we had in the thirties and that yeah. that is what scares me the most. So, uh, well, thanks so much for coming on. Why don't you go ahead and, uh, and give yourself, a uh, you know, a shout out and plug anything that you have going on. And, uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, no, I, it was, it was a really interesting conversation. Just always good to talk about this stuff. And like you, I'm like a massive pessimist. So <laughs> I want to, I want I want to get out of the UK um, as I get older, because I just don't want to watch it go down the toilet. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, my channel is the Cavernacle um, YouTube channel. Upload about three times a week, uh, stream twice a week. I'm going to stream later tonight. Don't know what I'm going to talk about. It's just whatever, whatever I feel like. Mainly um, at the moment, I'm making videos focusing on kind of obscure cults about like, Rhodesia or like Imperial Japan, just like these far right people who love these dead countries. Also, some stuff about <laughs> we yeah, talked yeah. about Rhodesia on my stream before as well because the uh, the guy who the, I'm sorry to interrupt you, middle of your no, show, no, it's fine, it's fine. But but uh, the guy who was uh, Derek Chauvin's medical expert actually said he was from Rhodesia, oh, which, really? as you know, Rhodesia doesn't exist. Uh, it was a it was never recognized by the international community. And so a white guy, he was born in, in, in Zimbabwe, but and he moved to America as a white man. And but he says like on his LinkedIn from Rhodesia. So he was yeah. like an extra. I mean, and that was the Derek Chauvin medical expert. Uh, so anyway, go on. Yeah. Sorry for that. So I'd be really no, interested no, no. to see your. I'd be really interested in seeing your, uh, <laughs> well, your video on that. Yeah, I, I call it. I call it the Boo series. So we call them Roadie Boos, and then we have like um, Tojo Boos, or people love Imperial Japan and stuff. But the the Roadie Boo one is, is one of my favorite ones, mainly because I've got dogpiled lately by some Rhodesian Facebook pages, which have linked it. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 they're, they're all coming to my page saying like oh, you're the actual racist one. Like, they fought the communists. You should love them and stuff. It's so basically saying it wasn't um, a racist country or anything like that because some black uh, Rhodesians fought in, like, the military. It, it's a load of shit, really. But anyway, um, there's loads of videos like that, uh, video game ones as well. And talk about politics on stream, maybe, like, British politics. But like you said at the start, no one really gives a shit on YouTube about British politics. So I'm I, not, do. Uh, <laughs> I do. I do. 
you can be you be my one watcher but yeah no um thank you so much for having me on i i re really enjoyed it and yeah so if anyone wants to come check out my channel just the cabernacle on everything just type in the cabernacle on google and loads of stuff come boom up. <laughs> all right well i have the mods they're spamming your information right mods you're spamming it right. they've been spamming it as we've been talking i hope you enjoyed the conversation i know i did uh thanks no, for coming on awesome. and uh i really appreciate your perspective and uh hope to see uh, a lot more content from you thanks bud yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks so much for having me on. See you later. See ya. We do politics here every morning starting at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific. You can watch us here on Twitch. We're the morning guy. The morning politics guy. Politics frogs in every single day. Same time, 10 a.m. Day in, day out. And we carry you through your morning and early afternoon politics needs. And if you need more, Mike from PA, we have a YouTube channel. We talked about suburbs, the My Pillow guy, Ted Cruz. We talked about DSA. Amazing. Making fun of Tim Pool. Amazing. Look at all of these amazing videos. Get in there, watch them. We have me on Twitter. You gotta follow me on Twitter, chat. I'm at 20,614 subs. That means I got like 40 followers on Twitter in the last day. You can do better than that. You can do better than that. Go follow us on Twitter. And of course, join the Discord where we have an incredible community of left-wing streamers. We have left-wing community. We talk about the stream. We talk about politics. There's gaming content. It's a really awesome supportive place. Direct action, mutual aid. And you can just let off some steam. And also, you can help produce the show. One of the things I do is I look at the links that are put into the news content suggest suggestions chat room on the Discord. Join the Discord, come hang out, and uh, maybe what you want me to talk about will be part of the next show.